I'm excited to introduce to you our esteemed panel tonight. Um, all very successful and talented writers, members of our chapter. Uh, our theme tonight is uh, independent publishing. But let me introduce to you uh, the panel first of all. On my far right and on your left, Tom Harrell. Tom is the author of Wager Easy, a sports betting mystery thriller and Wager Tough. Both books receive starter reviews from Crocus Reviews. Wager Tough was selected by Crocus as one of the best indie books of 2021 and one of the best indie mystery thrillers of 2021. Tom is a multi talented author. You may not know this, but he's a, he's a retired attorney. But he also worked one time as a golf course starter, as a chemist, and he quoted at Chicago City Hall while attending law school. He's also a former vice president of Rocky Mountain Fiction Writers and was a 2021 finalist for Rocky Mountain Fiction Writers Independent Writer of the Year. He had articles in Mystery and Suspense magazine, and when he's not writing, you can find Tom on the golf course or at a jazz club. Thanks for being with us, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Everybody knows Lori, but you may not know some of these things about Lori. Uh, <laughs> 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 Lori began her writing journey at the age of 14, making up stories about teens, navigating the precarious world between childhood and adulthood. Her inspiration was S.C. Hinton and the Troubles Pony Boy and the game encountered in The Outsiders. Those troubles seem tame compared to the entanglements her characters find themselves in now. Whether hunting serial killers, taking on outlaw motorcycle gangs, or facing a threat from the Russian mob, her characters are guaranteed to bring you hours of suspense. Lori attended her first writing conference more than 20 years ago, and since has studied the art and craft of fiction writing through reading many a book, picking the brains of best-selling authors, and of course a whole lot of writing and editing. Lori is a lover of coffee, books, music, yoga, Pilates, wine, travel, and most of all, dogs. She lives in Centennial, Colorado, with three adorable Pomeranians, and she's, of course, president of our Rocky Mountain chapter of Mystery Writers of America. Mm -hmm. Next is Jody Burnett. Jody is a Colorado native and a mountain girl at heart. She loves writing mystery and suspense thrillers from her small ranch southeast of Denver, where she goats on her horses. I want to know about this. She complains about her cows. <laughs> and she writes to create a home for her imaginings. She's the author of three series, Flint River, FBI K-9 Thrillers, and Ten Star K-9. And this year, she's starting a new U.S. Marshall Thriller series. She's published 13 novels. Her books are available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook formats. Inspired by life in the country, Jody fosters her creative side by writing, watercolor painting, quilting, and crafting stained glass. She's a member of Novelist Inc. and Sisters of Crime. Right here is Sue Hinken. Sue was voted Rocky Mountain Fiction Writers Writer of the Year for 21-22. She was raised in Chicago as a former college teacher and administrator. TV news photographer and NBC TV art department manager. She was also a cinematography fellow at the American Film Institute. The thrillers featuring Los Angeles TV news journalist B. Jackson and photographer Lucia Vega have been recognized with multiple awards, including the Colorado Book Award for Best Thriller, the Colorado Authors League Best Thriller, and the Forward Indies Best Mystery. Book five in the Vega and Middleton series Prescription for Murder has recently been released. Sue lives in Littleton, Colorado, where she's the new grandmother of twin girls who already love a good book. And she's our vice president. So welcome to our panel. I'm going to start off with, with a series of questions. I'll probably have more questions than we'll have time. Um, and then hopefully we can leave some time for questions from the audience on that time. Um, we'll kind of set the stage, you know, 1990s is not that far away from where we are today, but that's when e-books became uh, available for sale online. 
and desktop publishing and printing on demand technology made a lot of that available. 2007, Amazon launched the Kindle e-reader and Apple launched the iPhone. Those two devices changed the way people started reading books. Today, it's considered the third wave of independent publishing, where now authors can sell their work directly to readers via subscription models, crowdsourcing, and a whole plethora of other options that were never available to authors before. So I'd like to start with, let's start with Lori. What, what was your decision to start self-publishing your novels? Um, it was really time and money. Um, by the time I got done with my book, it took, I, I published my first book in 2006 with a small press. And I thought from that point forward, I would write a book a year, like most people do. And that didn't happen. <laughs> Work got, life got in the way, and it took 10 years for me to actually write the next book I wanted, which was 99.3. And at that point, I had a window of opportunity that um, I had left my job, and I had maybe enough money to stop child for about two years. But by the time I started looking for an agent, and you all know back there how long it takes for them to respond, my patients lasted about 10 agents. In, and at the time, I was into Mark Dawson's course and Nick Stevenson's course on self-publishing. And I thought, I can do this. And I just felt like, I've got this window. I need to make money. I'm just going to do it myself. And that's really what dictated it in my circumstances at the time. So I have a similar story. I, I, I did shop my first book and the patients to wait for the exemption to ever for them to get back. And you, 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 you might, they might ask for a goal, and then you are so excited, and it's not what they're looking for. And it's, it was too much for me. So I, I did the same. I had the influence of the people and it directed me towards also Mark Johnson's course, which I highly recommend if anybody is interested in self publishing. This course is complete and fantastic. You step by step from everything. In part to keep you from changing your own career. So I, I went ahead and, and published my first book, the first book in the Clinton series in 2019. It was, was fun. It's, I like having the control of my entire career. With that comes the entire responsibility too, so you have to have that kind of determination. But um, it's a lot of fun, and the indie community is very supportive. So that you can ask anybody anything, and everybody's willing to help. So, thank you. Thank you. Go to Tom. Tom and I were in the same critique group, and we were first getting our feet wet with writing fiction. And when did you make that decision to? Well, I started uh, with Wager Top was my first book, and uh, I uh, got a small time gambler who uh, uh, doesn't deal with the mob or he's going to find a killer for the mob. And uh, with this book, I sent out the cold query letters and I did get an agent out of New York based on the cold query. And uh, he went to market in 2016. And uh, it's interesting to go to market. And uh, for example, one of the big five said, it's a great premise, we love the protagonist, but it's an overcrowded market. So since I can't go and start writing YA, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and I said to them, I said to my, you know, well, what, what's next for this? We were at Thriller Fest, and they can try another book. So I tried another book. I 
started writing uh, the what if of that book. It was another one in the same series with the same character. And uh, this particular book uh, was a what if, what if sports betting was legalized? Who would be the major players? What would happen with the old time bookies? Uh, who would be against whom? And it'd be set in Chicago. Well, while I was writing that book, Lo and behold, the Supreme Court decided to say, yeah, no, that's what, and why not just legalize the whole thing? But it depended on each state. So all the uh, legal issues come into play. So that made it even more interesting for me. And it became, uh, since I'm an old time horse player, this all became a real passion. <laughs> and uh, so then when I brought Ray Teresi to my agent, you know, I'm kind of tainted at this point. You know, I, I've been through the mill and I'm no longer new. And so I was rejected. Uh, and so that's when I decided I'm going to go ahead and uh, just do this on my own. So uh, I have these two books out, and uh, the third book will be uh, is with my editor right now. So the, the series continues. You, you're published by it. Traditional publisher, and what was your decision making for going that route versus independent? Yeah, I, I work with a small uh, indie publishing company here in Denver, and it worked really well for me. I got to, I bet I worked the first book that was published was in the 30 year journey. I'm sure that's rather the basis. But um, about 25 years ago, I guess. I had gone the agent route, didn't get it, you know, it's just taking too much time. Uh, and I sent it over the transom uh, to Penguin, and I got a call back from an editor. And the editor started working on the changes of the book. Then she ended up finding out that she had a stage for breast cancer, got her job, and went back. Home and all of those things that were her projects were gone. So it's back to zero. So um, I had uh, some other situations with edit with uh, agents. Uh, it didn't work well for me. Um, and when I finally been in Denver 10 years and got um, immediately involved with Rocky Mountain Fiction Writers. So I say that I've got my MFA in the back, you know, the back tables of Panera and with <laughs> so many people in the back that is part of that. And uh, so at one of the Rocky Mountain Fiction Writers Colorado Little Conferences, I start talking to Susan Brooke, who had run the small small company here in, in Denver. And um, she was willing to read my book and offered me you know, publication at that point. And so my first book, that book, that 30th attorney, whatever, came out in 2018. It's perfect for me because although I love this idea of controlling um, my work, my career, uh, I feel like I'm just too old. I just don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to spend all this time and energy learning how to to do all these things that um, that you need to do if you're going to be so much. Um, the, the marketing drives me crazy enough, you know, about taking on all the other dimensions of it. So working with a small publisher has been great because I have um, a lot of feedback. You know, I can tell them I hate the, the, the uh, Cover and they'll, they'll say, okay, what do you think you like? You know, but really, we, we're, we're a team. We really work together as a team. And um, and I don't have to pay for anything. I'm not responsible for setting the type or, you know, the all that type of thing. Um, really just write the book and then I, then I have an opportunity to work to get it out there. So that's, that's worked well for me. Well, that's a great segue to my next question. We couldn't, we didn't plan this. So. <laughs> next question is one of the one of the pros of independent publishing is that you are in control of the whole process. Could you talk a little bit about what's involved in that process and, and how do you manage one 
your time to do it, and how do you manage a, a budget to make it happen? Take that first. Budget. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, um, it's a lot of work. I'm not going to. I, I consider myself full-time, like, I'm eight hours a day, kind of a writer. I don't write eight hours a day. I write in the morning, usually from about 9 to noon, and then the afternoon I set aside for a business, and in business I am marketing my books. I think I'm not just, gosh, I'm trying to do it step-by-step. Step. You have to have, you know, have a cover, you have to, and I have a cover designer that I work with, and it's a great cover designer, and she's really Wonderful to work with. So he lets me go back and forth with him a million times. Um, I have different software that is helpful to me. There's a software called Bellum, which I use. There's one coming out for PC, which is called Packet, which sounds maybe even better than Bellum, but Bellum is fantastic. It's for Mac, and um, I can <laughs> upload a Word doc and it formats the entire thing in about three seconds. It's brilliant. And so you can choose all these types of things. That part is super easy. So that's quick. I am exclusive to Amazon with most of my books right now. So that makes it a little easier for me. I only have one. Well, I only had one for a while. I'm taking my first series out of exclusivity. So it'll still be on Amazon, but it won't be in KU. And um, I, I'm going wide, what we call wide with that. So I'll, so I'll sell that anywhere. Primarily I'm doing that because I have my own bookshop to my website. This is new for me this year. That's also the same work, but I like to learn it all. I like to learn and grow and change, and, it, and everything changes every six months, so you have to stay on top of it, but it's, it's exciting to me. Um, I've made the mistake of, of letting it be a 16, 18-hour job when I was first started out because I was excited. It wasn't that it was a graduating, but I, I just wanted to do it. It's all I wanted to do, and now I really have boundaries around that because only working. But um, all those pieces, there's, I don't know, it's hard for me to, to even think of all the millions of pieces. Um, it might be easier for you to ask me about some of your concerns about that. How do you manage your time? Like she said, it's, it's a lot of work. So, same thing, when I got in, uh, I was my first two books in 2018, in May of 2018, and I was super excited. I just wanted to dive in, especially because I am a daddy, and I thought, I love spreadsheets. So when I'm taking the courses, and they're dumping all this data down from Amazon and Facebook, I'm thinking, yes, I can do this. I love this stuff. But I can also go down the big data rabbit hole for hours and hours. Um, and yes, I spent way too many uh, 12, 15 hour days doing that, seven days a week. Suddenly, where I was doing that, um, complaining when I worked, you know, I can work weekends. Now I was working all the time, but I did. I really did love it. And there is so much to learn because it's kind of a domino effect. So when you start one thing, then you have to learn advertising, well then you have to learn how to put together a good ad in it. So then you're looking at things like Canva or Bookbrush to learn how to put together good ads. Or you're learning how to write ad copy. You're learning how to do A B testing, you know, on different headlines or different copy. Um, see which ones, you know, get a better response. So there is a whole um you know, time requirement as far as the marketing side as well. Um, and then there's reader magnets. And, oh, you need to write a book for free and give it away because that's how you build your mailing list. It's like, wait, I have to write a book for free and give it away? That's time. That takes time. So um, building your mail list. Oh, and then you get to learn a mail list. You know, you get to learn a, a mail chance or one of the other programs. So it is kind of a domino effect. You have to really like to be able to learn a lot of things. And if if you don't like that aspect, um, there are things that you can carve out. I do work with a good cover designer. Okay, you have to have an editor. Those things you can find on places like Fiverr and the VC. Um, 
work with those. And there are people that can do the marketing side for you. It's just a matter of what you want to pay out for and what you want to do on your own. I know you and I have talked a bit about the marketing that you've been studying and learning about. Yeah, I've got a whole list. You like spreadsheets, I have lists. You have lists. Oh, yeah, I like lists too. Has <laughs> that been helpful to you? Well, so, yeah, I worked with uh, a publicity agent out of Chicago who uh, was recommended by Carter Wilson. And uh, they had a community, and they would have regular monthly meetings uh, virtually. And uh, they'd even have a virtual conference uh, with uh, editor panels and uh, aging panels and uh, other helpful people, how to brand, uh, how to do these other things. And uh, he's kind of the publicity agent has kind of changed up things now. But uh, we do have something uh, he's still involved, and we've got uh, something on what promos working, what promos don't next week uh, going on this search. Uh, so that's one thing I got involved in. Uh, sometimes, like last, uh, uh, I needed time to write my next book, so I shoved off a lot of the advertising over to uh, this. Bitsy Bitsy, that was at RMFW. I had no money, probably not. Uh, so sometimes I do that. Otherwise, I, I followed up with all the stuff that uh, Lori has talked about as well with the newsletters. Uh, but I, I did have to take some time off from family issues and then to write you know, my own book. So I just, I'm just playing the long game. I'm like two books in, and they're able to give away free books because I don't have enough books, enough inventory to sell. It is definitely a long game. I think you all probably agree with that, that. It's not a short. But I thought it would be, oh, I can make a lot of money in a couple of books. But it really is a long game. To make that money and that profit because it's, it's all about read through and getting people on your, on your list and getting your readers. If you advertise what you're spending for that first book, it's getting them to read the second and the third. So most of the authors I know that are making a profit say they it took them about seven books before they started seeing that. Or they had enough reason to be able to make that profit. But all of you it would right. be interesting to see what you think about that. Because I think you were a little quicker than that. All four of you write series, and some of you write more than one series. Um, do you do you feel that the series actually does help promote sales? Yeah. Is that because and why is that? Is that because readers like to follow the same protagonist? I think yes, but I think primarily what you're saying is about that read through. You can that's where your income comes from. So I have three series, but they're all attached by either. Co workers or family members, and, and from the very first one to the very end one, you can follow. And so, my readers really enjoy that, even though the stories themselves are basically standalone. So, yeah, you can really engage with the reader, and you can you really only have to spend your advertising dollar on your first in the series. Whereas, if you're writing standalone, you are going to have to advertise each one of those independently. So, it's covered. What do you think is the sweet spot for the price of a book? Anything from 99 cents to 2.99 to 9.99. What, what's working for you? Um, I started out at 2.99, but yes, one thing you know is with with Amazon, you get 70 percent royalty. It has to be over um, two dollars. Most people would set it to 99 because below that, it's only going to get 35%. So you hear a lot about people have 99 cent books. They must be raking it in. You sell so many books. First of all, you really don't sell a lot of books. 99 cents is amazing how price sensitive people have gotten. And also, you're making 30 cents a book if you do that. Um, I think the sweet spot now is 499 for ebook. 
I'm starting to see some people go a little higher than that. Um, I'm sticking with $4.99 right now. Um, paperback $12.99. That the cost doesn't seem to have gone up a lot there. And it's 60% royalty on the paperback. So I don't know what do you what do you think? Well, I, I have an opinion about this. I think there's a lot of people who do, you know, three and ninety nine cents. For promotion reasons, I think that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, it's unnecessary. We don't want to undervalue our work. It's hard work. Yeah, right? hard work. It's hard stuff. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't ever go that way. Um, I started my my ebook at four ninety nine. They're currently all at five ninety nine right now. My <laughs> is at fourteen ninety nine, and it can help you with genre. So mystery and crime can generally get a better price. I think um, it has to do with length of books too. Although why not just every month? So um, I raised prices and I didn't notice any mm -hmm. drop. Mm -hmm. So I think that was, that worked for me. Um, I've seen other indie authors go even higher. So I'm a holder. <laughs> 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 but yeah, like, no one just knows. Well, no one knows. Do you ever rub? Uh, have like the entry point of your, your series at a lower rate and then as books as the read through goes to a number of different other books in the series increase those prices a lot of people do that i don't i only do that if i'm writing it's just my style so I just don't. how about when you have a new release do you do, you do any of that with the I low price the pre -order. you get yeah. like pre-orders on a discount um just usually have a dollar off and I'm doing a little trick right now because I just opened a shop from my website, my shop by shop. So I have a pre-order on my shop by shop for this new series I'm writing. And it has a prequel to the to the series and the prequel will be free. It is free, but only on my bookshop. So I, you can pre-order on my bookshop for four ninety nine and get the prequel for free. Or you can pre-order on Amazon for five ninety nine. And right now it's running about your books running around 300 pages or are they shorter? They're shorter. Really? Yeah, Oh, wow. 65,000. Yeah, which is short for 599, and that's why it's better. For somebody in the audience who's thinking about doing their very first self published book, what should we plan on budgeting? So I'm a big fan of your book. And the Dell. <laughs> so I think it really good for almost nothing. And so I, I recommend trying to do it that way. It is a little bit more work, um, but you can, you write your book for free, obviously, and then um, you were saying, Lori, about Kindle. Kindle has a format. Yeah, right? Kindle also has a format. It's a free Kindle Create. And it's, yeah. it's, it's creates your, your format, your book, just as you're writing it. Like, Prepares everything for publishing. So, you can you so you do that for free, but then what about paying for cover design, like you can marketing, cover design and how, how much do you have to pull out of your piggy bank to pick it's a wide, wide range. range. Yeah, you could find something in your budget, but my first covers were done by a gal on Fiverr and I was spending like fifty dollars a cover. Well wow. search. Well a stand. I don't think that would be more, but she she did a great job. And um the other thing you really want to buy for is editing. Yeah. yeah. Again, it can be a huge range. But I definitely take with the bulk of your money there for a bit of Yeah. And then I would even advertise. You don't really need to advertise your first book. Good. Because unless you have someone to send them after that first book, you're probably just, it'd be better to just get it out there on social media, I think. Which is also why some people are holding up and writing at least three books in the series before they start releasing them. So that they can actually, because Amazon has a relevance of about three months. So now authors are really trying to push the envelope and come out with a new title like every, you know, three to six months at times. Six months can be pushing it because your relevance starts going down. And relevance all plays in your Amazon app. I cannot write a book in three months, even at full time. <laughs> I'm still not that speedy of a writer. Um, 
those people that have been really successful have been hanging on to that. And if you can push that book every four to six months. Um, so if you're starting out, I would recommend I'd write three books and then I would release the first one, quickly release the second one, maybe two months later, three months later, and then another one, and then keep going if you can. Since you're with a traditional publisher, you still have to do a lot of your own marketing? I'd say 95% of my own marketing. I think that's really typical of whoever is publishing. Maybe less if you're working with the big five publishers, but the people who are working with them are still doing a lot of their own marketing. So all the things that folks who are doing self-publishing are doing marketing, I'm trying to also navigate and do those what do you think works the best? Is it social media? Is it <laughs> advertising? Is it word of mouth? Email. Email list. And everybody, no matter how you are published, you have a newsletter. And that is your absolute best. But that's another thing you need to write, right? A newsletter? Yeah. It doesn't have to. I, 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 how often is your newsletter going? Yeah, once a month. I do one once a week, but it's it's just a short little. It, it doesn't have to be a big thing that have one on. Mm -hmm. How do you create your lists? The reader magnet. I know we both use Book Funnel. Um, Book Funnel has a lot of promotion. Again, here's that learning thing, right? The domino effect. You get the reading. <laughs> You create the mail list, and now you're like, no, how do I get readers? So there's, there are promotions out there. Um, Book Funnel has been done very well for me. I usually onboard about 300 um, readers a month. I have um, a free book that's uh, only available as a freebie if you join my list um, that they get. Um, actually, most of the time I don't make it mandatory. I make it optional, and I still get about 300 bucks. Um, they join your mail list, and you you create that whole welcome series of emails, and you kind of onboard them, get to know you, to get to know the series. You try not to be too sales pitchy um, in the beginning, but you try to you really try to build that relationship with your readers. I'm thinking that this is starting to sound like a huge long thing. It's not that hard. It's I know. Hard. And really, it, it can get overwhelming. I can remember days when I started, I was like, I'm so overwhelmed. I don't know where to do. Like, you're just frozen. Like, I just don't even know which, which way to turn. You really have to take off a fight at a time. Like, Tom was saying, it's a long game. Learn one thing, get really good at it. Try working at that. Start working at another promotion angle to get it back. Book funnel though has promotions that you can join. And you authors create these giveaways. Um, they'll have like, you know, best mysteries mystery and suspense freebies of April or whatever. And uh, you can join those. And there's usually about fifty books. I think there's a free level of MVP that's to the phone. Mm -hmm. So you don't even have to pay them. It's just I mean, when you're starting you can just yeah, be a part of. And then, and then it's like what, two hundred dollars for the year or something like that. Yeah, yeah. With all the dollars. Right. So that's one way. But the reader magnet. Some people use Facebook ads. I find I don't do any more Facebook ads right now. I'd be interested to hear from you if you guys do. But I have found that Facebook has really fallen off. When it used to be kind of the golden child of of advertising, I just stopped doing them. I have stopped as well. I think several of you mentioned how you're publishing is changing constantly. How, how do you keep up? Uh, who, who you go to for advice, or, or do, you, do you just read this? And um, how do you stay on top of things? Really, community. Yeah. And you 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 hear the buzz in the community. There's a group called Twenty Books. Twenty Books. Yeah. It was originally called Twenty Books. 20 books and 50k. I think because the premise was that you could write 20 books that you would make 50k. Yeah, and people were like, 50k? I'm going to make a lot more. <laughs> when they wrote 20 books and didn't make 50k, they were coming back and they were like, yeah. And it wasn't. So, you know, and now the guy, Craig Martin, runs like, first you have to write a good book. Like, you yeah. can't just throw books out there. But 
Anyway, it is a fantastic organization as far as they have a conference from here and all the vendors come and all of anyone who knows anything is there and you can learn and network. It's just a fantastic community. But you have a community everywhere. There's communities here and you know my friends and the mastermind and they get all different ways to hear what's going on and everybody has their finger on the phone. You know, it used to be that you know, people who self-published books, there was a stigma attached mm -hmm. to that. It just wasn't as prestigious as traditional publishing. Do you think that's true anymore? Yeah, I think some of it, it's a little bit of regionalism to that. Mm -hmm. um, I, although I think it's changing hugely, and Denver is certainly a place where everything is embraced. Um, but I think... Uh, Friends, writers on the East Coast, there's uh, still a little bit of that going on. Uh, I think uh, it's still there, but I think it's uh, on the way out. Absolutely. Well, because we know that. You know, I've, Go ahead, I've seen things where somebody comes up to me and they say, I decided to read your book. Like they're doing yeah. a big thing, they're <laughs> taking a leap for me and I. Uh, it's just a book, okay? It's it's still you know, <laughs> and it's not like we can go out and talk about traditional publishing and what we think of that. Uh, at least I don't. So hopefully, by word of mouth, people start to believe in your book, even though it's an indie book. And even though they might be biased against it, yeah, and they won't call it indie. There's still people that will constantly. You, you can say it's indie, and they will be like, "Stop that much, stop that Even on certain circles, it shouldn't be that way. There's still very much that. Oh, because because their belief is that you wouldn't choose to go to this path. That. Oh, for those people that had no choice but to go that path. And I've been trying to break that down with people. Like, you know, some people actually choose to go indie. It's not that we all shopped it around for years and we all got turned down and rejected. But that's just not true. Many, many people now choose the indie path. I think I think yeah. it started with that. People thought maybe, well, you, you know, it was just that. So you, yeah. You right. can tell it yourself and then you tell it's a horrible book and maybe these books are bad and right. you know, there's no quality control. And, and I think that what I, my response to that is that there is a gatekeeper. There's the reader. It's the gatekeeper of the market. Whether if your book sells, it's because people don't want to read it. If it doesn't sell, then there's a lot of reasons why that might be, but one of the reasons might be you need to tighten up your book. But if your book is if you're doing well, I think it's evident that just listening to the four of you, you work as hard and, and as professionally as any author, regardless of how they're published. Maybe working harder. Mm -hmm. And I'm also finding that people who um, do it all, do their own self-publishing, everything that folks are doing here. Uh, I probably, among the writers, folks that I know who are making the most money, um, the traditional writers uh, are not making as much as somebody who's got 20 books and posts them themselves and have to read through and have marketing down. And, you know, they're doing really well. And I know uh, people who have gotten uh, very successful with traditional publishers, and then they went off and did it on their own yeah. so that they can make enough money because the publisher is taking such a big cut and they feel that they can do a lot of this on their own and doing a lot of it anyway, and why shouldn't I get paid for it? And so uh, that's what you really see is, is even the traditional author moving to independent. Oh, yeah, the difference. I mean, what are you, 70%? Is that what you mean? I mean, I get 20%. I mean, it kills me. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing more than someone who moves. I do. Yeah, yeah. I do. Yeah, exactly. Some
that fit into your marketing scheme? Is it going to generate sales for you as well? I have not jumped into audiobooks, and I know that I'm missing a big chunk in the market, and I need, that's one thing on my list for this year. Audiobook. Probably as a royalty share, because I don't know that I can see the upfront cost. They are expensive. They are, they are one thing that is expensive to do if you want to keep the full royalty. But I know you have audiobooks, so. Yeah, I do. All of my books. Well, the first series, yeah. But two of my series are in, in audio. And have sent to pay for themselves. So, but it, it takes a while. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Did you keep the royalty or did you share? I kept it. Okay. Yeah, which was a big, it was a big, scary investment on the first go. But again, it was more serious to come into play because I was able to do the series. And so you can see the read through. And you can watch it on your dashboard, on your data. You can oh. watch the read through because you get. About 80% of your of your reader your first book or your third book, then go on to the second, and then it's something like 70% of that, 80%, then 70% of that, 70%. I don't know what it is you would know, <laughs> but, uh, but you just want it, and so that's what it helps us. And again, the exciting thing about having my own shop, through book funnel is just in beta right now, but they have a the ability to release your audio through book funnel, and so I can. Way discount my price so that they're like $17.99 something like that on ACS because they're, they're out of all. And I, I have my shop can sell them, I'm selling them for $7.99 because when someone buys that book, it's digital and I pay $7.99. Like, well, I have to pay the amount to pay the pay the of the transaction. Otherwise, I'm, I'm making maybe a dollar, fifty dollars on a book if, if possible. Mm, I need to pick the brain about that. Yeah. yeah. So it's, uh, my, my publisher held the right to audiobooks, and I was able to negotiate to get the audiobook rights and all television media right away back. I'm really happy right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. Have any of you delved into foreign rights? <clears throat> I haven't. One of those baby step things, a little bit of time. I haven't even spent time, and I, I know that I hear a lot of people are having success in the German market. It's pretty hot right now. Um, I never got really any good footing too much in the UK either. Although Canada, I will have to say, is actually, there are months that I make more from Canada than I do in the US. I don't know why, but I've taken off from Canada. Are you exclusive to Amazon? I am exclusive to Amazon. So I do well in Canada. Oh, Canada. <laughs> I had a moment where South Africa was showing. How about uh, video? Are any of you doing using YouTube as a channel or teasers like that? Video teasers. You are. Yeah. Yeah. I. I. Um, fair number of views. But I, my background is film television, so I like making little things. Uh, and so, yeah, I have a, a little small YouTube channel with a teaser for four of my five books. Yeah, I'm not bad I'm just bad my ability to <laughs> Fiber, um, several friends who sent me Fiber for maybe $150 for wonderful little teasers. So. And you can make them a book or a book brush. Yeah, I haven't done. TikTok is getting pretty good for books right now. Um, book talk? Book talk. Yeah. I have not. I'm the same. I don't, I don't like to judge, so I would need to like find some person to be my. <laughs> yeah, or, or maybe, maybe I don't know, maybe not, not a person, or just maybe some kind of a tease or something. I'm not sure, but I haven't. I haven't seen. I'm looking in that. I have that book trailer. I did for my last one, but I do have book trailers. One more question, then we'll turn it over to uh, questions for the audience. And. We got together in, in advance and talked about some things that we, we wanted to discuss tonight. And one of the 
of the questions I asked, so I'm not putting anybody on the spot here, I said, I understand that some people in independent publishing are doing very well and can actually be making six figures. And one of our panelists said, yes, they are. <laughs> Would that person speak up? <laughs> <laughs> How did you do that? And how long did it take? Well, my short story is that I when I published my first book in 2019, and I had the first series. And it right, nothing exciting. And I was excited and I was doing it and getting leaders and building all of the infrastructure and all that kind of thing. Then I also it was during COVID, and I think that might have something to do with it. Don't for me, but you can't read any of that. I published my first book in my FBI K9 series and um, it just it took off as far as a first book in a series can take off and I was so excited and then I wrote the next one and it did even better and then we sort of watched this thing grow and it was it was just really exciting. Um, yeah, and you're making seventy percent on these books you guys in publishing it's just gonna make more money for books. You get hands down. Traditional publishing has better distribution. But really, you can even get your, you can get books in bookstores too. You know, um, I'm sure you do too. But you know, get you do probably. So it's just, it's just, they're just like an indie book. Yeah, yeah. And um, and you just keep building. You just build the community. Build a community that way that the owner is. Your greatest asset. If you build a community with these people, they want to talk to you, they want to interact with you. And so I have, you know, they can email, I answer every single email, I answer it myself. I have Facebook groups, they're a lot of us, they're a bunch of people. And they all like to talk about dogs, so dogs are the big thing. Um, it's just a lot. I really, really enjoy that part. It's very true to me, so um, that's the deal. But yeah, so last year, Two years, <laughs> two years ago, I cracked the hundred thousand dollar mark and it shocked me. Last year, I made one hundred and forty thousand dollars in this year. I'm on to get to make five hundred and fifty-five. My goal is two hundred. And it's just, it, like I said, it's a lot of hard work. But the more you write, the more you can work your backlist. So it's really not the book you're writing that's going to make you the money. It's your backlist. So it's about marketing and about connecting your your series and talking about it with your, your newsletter. There's a lot of strategy and, and tactics involved in that, but it's fun. That part's not hard work. Um, we paid marketing right now is not really worth the, the money. I had a pretty good ad on Facebook in February and March, and then it just tanked, and so I turned it off. And that's the rough part, right? You think you've got something nailed down, and right? the ad is working so well for you, and then they change algorithms, or, or something just gets changed, and you don't even know what or why, yeah. and it just suddenly stops working. Okay. That's, that's good. Good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, you. Uh, you try to get your book accepted and then book up. Book up. Thank you. Um, I've had some luck with that. I've done it once for each of the books. First time they would only send it out to non United States. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> South Africa. <laughs> and, um, that, has, that has been, uh, it gave me a nice little spice for a while. Maybe one. I've not, I've not only had international book I've never had a US book I just got one this last, uh, and, uh, yeah, I sold things for 99 cents, but I sold a lot of them. But that's good for getting, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 I know that's probably for me. So your average chance, like, okay, for that money, like, what are you spending, like, at? And if that's a funny thing, because that's a, such a good question, because people will say, oh, yeah, I'm a seven-figure author, but if you're spending almost seven figures on advertising, you're not really making it. Right, money. right. So, to interest, again, I'm back for the biggest thing for your buck. I don't spend that much. I spend about 
anywhere from three hundred to six hundred dollars a month on Amazon. That's and it. Way less on that. like maybe well, mm -hmm. I was spending about three hundred dollars when we had that really good ad running on Facebook, but right now I'm not spending <laughs> anything on Facebook. So no, that's yeah. yeah. So the so, main is that there's your mail. It's email. What, what, how many folks do you have to do this? I have almost 10,000. Oh, that's not, that's a great list. It's not fabulous either. Like, they're yeah. just kind of on the road, really. So, but I keep cutting that back. Like, you don't want to pay for people on your list that aren't opening your emails or reading your book. So, you, so you, your email service helps you figure that out. That's where I am right now. Yeah, reaching out. Mm -hmm. It's better to have a smaller yeah. list that's more active than it is to have a big, huge number. Sure, some of you have some questions. Yeah. Uh, a number of you have talked about the importance of working with an editor when you're independently publishing. Can you talk a little bit about how you found your editors and how you chose the editors that you wanted to work with? I found mine through Readsy. So there's Fiverr and there's Readsy. Readsy is also has everything from book cover designers, marketers, just about anything you would need. And you can go on there, um, look at look at their profiles, see what other books they've done, um, and you, then you can ask for an editorial sample as well. And find people in your budget and your cost. And can they get it done when you need to get it done? So it, it, all those pieces have to come together. And then when you find somebody that have, have a fresh book and you like them, then you can tell me a lot that's how I found mine. Reedsy also, everybody that Reedsy recommends has been that. Yeah, it's really good. So it's not as risky. It's not like anybody can go, I'm another author. I think your other authors, too, you know, they you know, recommend. That's how I got my editor was from, recommendation by another author. And it turned out the editor was from Chicago originally, and I was writing a book in Chicago. <laughs> A request and then a question. The request is for those of us who are blissfully ignorant of most of the things that you're talking about, mm -hmm. not the processes as much as the sources. Could you, I don't know, spell out what they are? I don't know. You're talking about read C, rip C, rip C. No, yeah, I've heard of book bug. You know, actually, I. Heard I I was going to put a resource, like okay. a resource sheet yeah. together. Yeah, I could, I could I do it. Oh, good. Maybe put it online. We can. Yeah. We can. Yeah. 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 Because there yeah. are some. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 It is like that. Like, it is a domino effect where you yeah. just start on one thing and then you're like, somebody says, oh, well, just go to Bitly and do this. Yeah. Or just go yeah. to, you know, like, yeah. like, yeah. Yeah. like what is it? Like, yeah. book record? So it's yeah, so, yeah. so it's always, you just start getting this huge list of like, oh, again, password. Yeah. And yeah, you have a whole list of just writing resources. Yeah. Some of those it's kind of like the first first trip to the live creation convention.
agents is through a convention. Sadly, that is the way it go. Through a conference, mm -hmm. through somebody you know, a writer or uh, a seminar that they give that you took online, whatever it might be, it's, it's, uh, that seems to be the way that most people are getting access to opportunities, agents and other publishers. Caution for, for if, if you're interested in going to a small press, there's nothing wrong with that. Like, I know a ton of my friends do it and have a small press. But beware, right? This is also beware. Um, you should never be paying anyone to publish. Okay, so if that you know if that's the offer, yeah, not or chipping in on any expenses. Oh, we'll help you. Like I have my own publishing imprint, and so I could. Feasibly at some point, create, start doing publishing for other people. But if I said, hey, chip in $200 towards the marketing campaign every month, that should not happen. <laughs> and there are people doing that now because it is easy to start your own publishing company. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people, authors banding together and kind of creating their own imprint. And also that they're becoming a publishing company and they're really they're really in the publishing with that word. So there's a lot of people starting that, that So way. as far as like market marketplace, you know, the um okay. and you can look up different um different agents, just what they were taking as mysteries, cozies, whatever. And uh, she had was like actually uh, uh, publishers market. Or like, publishers is market. that fairly responsible? Oh, that's oh, where it was. Okay, yeah. so yeah, there's a, a million brides. That's where people report their deals. And yeah. that, those are legit. Oh, okay. Publishers market for it. Okay. And okay. also, if you go with a small indie publisher, it's also beware in terms of contracts. Okay. Mm -hmm. Talk to an agent, talk to a uh, to an, um, a lawyer, I mean, or to another. Um, yeah, please don't sign the contract. An author with the experience with contracts um, definitely get some feedback. We had a lawyer here present to us who's a literary attorney, John Kendler. Mm -hmm. He's mm -hmm. also a resource. It's worth, it's worth the money. <clears throat> Get it done. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, so the NWA has a, a, a number of resources. On, on that. Yeah, and your NWA website has yeah. a list of must-haves that they recommend that you have a list of must-haves yeah. and should not have. Pay attention to that list. And most of all, use it for the right and, and look to see if your publisher is vetted and a member of NWA. Because if they're not, it's probably because they have a contract. Issue that they have one of the must not have. Well, they have to be working with agents too. It's just, well, a lot of small independent uh, publishers don't work with agents. The, the, the profit line isn't enough so that they can, you know, give money to the agents and everything. Anyway, so, um, and uh, mystery writers will not take on uh, small independent publishers that don't work with agents. They will not. Oh, did that oh, our, oh, we've had several that don't have agents. That have been that recently. But the NWA, I know since I've been on the site. Oh, that's good to know. That's good to know. Some of the writers have always done that, and so oh, that's really good to know. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, Laura, you said that you had a publishing imprint. Is there a benefit to that? And the reason I'm asking is I worked for a publisher, and when we wanted an ISBN, like they sent us 999 free. So I wondered if there was something like that or other other advantages. I did it for because the, I was going to also look at publishing something, some some um, low content, kind of like journals and other things that I was interested in. Um, under and so I didn't want it tied to my own writing, uh -huh. you know, my novels. And also, there's also a corporate tax benefit. So like right now, as long as you're a sole proprietor. Or an LLC, you can pretty much publish things. But when you, I had dreams of being you know, a six figure. Yeah, you all, you're all going to get there. But at some point, there's also an advantage to going corporate. And if you have that imprint, you can switch it to corporate and you pay a different tax rate, a lower tax rate. The problem with some of this is you're paying, you know, as an, as an 
and that you know in tax terms you're paying like the 14 percent you're paying you're paying the double social security right you're paying the employer side and the employee side so at a certain point if you're making enough money you might want to do you do it under a corporate or for an LLC you're still an LLC you still pay the double yeah but see at some point I was planning ahead and thinking, oh, I'm going to make enough money that I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to want to go to the corporate tax rate at some point and not double pay that. But yeah. okay, so there's other consequences. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, you, come out, you, you sell some of your own books. You mentioned bookshop. Are you selling the books off of your website? Is that what you're doing? Or what? Yes, I have a Shopify shop. That leads to my website. It's not actually on the website, but you can get there from okay. the website. Yeah. How are you directing traffic for that? How is that working? How do you? How does that work? Yeah, it's kind of well. It's interesting. It's slow for me right now. I just opened it on February 14th. It was my first grand opening day. So I don't have. I can't put any of my books that are exclusive to Amazon in my shop right now. So that's a challenge. My paperbacks are exclusive, so I have all of my paperbacks in it. And I have one series of audio books, and I have some merchandise. So it's a little slow right now. My big seller is the pre order. Because I haven't put that in KU, Kindle Unlimited, right now, it's mine, obviously. So I can do the pre order, and I can do it all on Amazon. Can you put a link in your bookstore to your Amazon? Yeah, but I wouldn't want to because so if I sell a book for four ninety nine, I'm making about honestly it's like four ninety five. So if I can get this going, it'll be great. But I have to, you know, I, I don't want to pull things out of KU because I the bulk of my income comes from the KU side of Amazon. So as those as I feel like it's financially wise to do so, I'll move it. And then I'll put them over into the shop and gradually go to the shop. So it's not going in investors yet. When when my but the game I'm playing with this is that my ebook that's on pre-order right now, when I launch it, it will go immediately to all of the people who ordered the book on pre-order. I'll leave it there for a short period of time, then I'm gonna have to take it off my shop and go exclusive on Amazon. It, it makes financial sense to do so. So right now, the big bulk of people are coming from my email list. I haven't actually marketed my shop beyond my email list at all. Yes. That does seem to be a new trend, though. Yeah. I'm hearing a lot of talk about that. I think the big thing, thing is audio. The audio. And that's, that's supposed to be the big thing. Um, I, I have a question for Tom. Um, when you uh, first, when you, who are you selling to? Oh, I'm exclusive to Amazon. I'm on Kindle Unlimited as well. Okay. Not yeah, I launched during the pandemic, so that was another. Yeah, yeah the pandemic was very helpful. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't have any launch parties. That's too bad. Yeah. Save money on your budget right there. Okay. Speaking of websites, I presume you all have one. Is it a is it a big part of your of your marketing and your customer contact now, or is it just a touchstone for all your other things? How do you use it? It's a big it's a big thing for me. I get a lot of people will come to my website and sign up to my email list through my website. Corporate headquarters. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you do like corporate headquarters? Yeah, Affinity stuff like stories about, you know, police dogs or, or you know, gambling tips or and you know, I mean, is there a reason well, to actually you can know, see old newsletters on there. Yeah. <laughs> it takes the place of a blog. Yeah, I don't I haven't used this I haven't used it as much as I should. I tend to use my newsletters more for that kind of thing. Um, I was, when I was running Facebook ads, I was directing um, a lot of that to landing pages and then storing to Amazon. Um, 
just so I could do better tracking because if you send them directly to Amazon, you can't do a lot of tracking. But a lot of that has gone away now too. So I, I'm not using my website very effectively right now. I I I uh, built my website through Wix, which is free, and uh, for me it worked really well. I just maintained it myself. W I X. Yes. Are you generating revenue from your website? Uh, I'm generating uh, people who sign up for the the, the email. So yes, indirectly. Yeah, indirectly. Yes. They can connect directly to. Amazon. Yeah, if you can think of it, but it's hard to track. Amazon makes everything really hard to track. So for somebody starting out, let's go down to the table. What's the one order of advice you would offer from your experience? Sue? Um, well, write a good book, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think having a website. And I think it's easy to do. Um, if you feel overwhelmed or stuck, there are so many people that even in this room can offer help. But I think you need an author website. I think that indicates the level of professionalism. Yeah. That's, that's the only way I think. Yeah. Keep writing. The more you have, the more books you have out there, the more you can make, the more people will find out who you are. Writing, keep working at it. And it's like emails, and you know, one side at a time. <laughs> it, it can be overwhelming, but again, it's a huge community. And I, I want to say too, if, if anybody has any questions for that, I'm always open to any questions or help out. Yeah, I'd say don't be in a hurry. I mean, like it's really figure out your plan and what what method. There are so many ways to publish now. Figure out really what works for you and your strengths and what you would have time to do and um, and what's important to you. Now, for some people, it is more important to have that traditional stance and to be to say they're bad at it and that they're you know they're legit because that in their mind that's still and if that's more your that's fine. There's no, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, 
We didn't have any actual questions from any people online. So we mentioned that we didn't have any. We never watched the Well, thank you, all of you, um, for your honesty and for sharing your experience. I thought it was fabulous, and uh, I hope you found it helpful. So thank you very much.